hope that you have a handout before you as we look at our study today on a baker's dozen blessings for generous giving. These are just things that uh, help us as we think about uh, what it means to, first of all, be a generous giver and uh, the blessings that are attached there too. You know, there is a reason that Paul quoted the Lord in Acts 20 and verse 35 when he said, You remember the words of our Lord, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, one thing I, I want to mention just a, by way of reminder, there is no record in the gospel accounts of Jesus ever making this statement. Now, that's not to say that Paul made it up, but it shows us that there are a lot of things that Jesus said that are not recorded for us in the scriptures. And it's because ultimately they are not necessary for us in order to know what is required of us by the Lord. But I also would note about this statement. It says, you well remember or know these words. Now, he's writing to the elder, or he's talking to the elders at Ephesus. And Ephesus was hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem and, and Judea. And yet, Paul said that these words were well known by these elders who were, again, hundreds of miles and a number of years removed from the events of the life and the teaching of Jesus. And so I, I've just always found that uh, interesting. And of course, at this time of the year, for us, it's our time to, to prepare our program of work. And uh, traditionally, I usually speak at least one time on, on the blessings and the obligations of giving. And of course, we're a little bit later in the year than we normally are. So, you know, right now we're, you know, we're right on top of Christmas. If memory serves me, I think it's this week. And so we think about, we think about at this time, we, I think, and better understand perhaps at this time more than any other, the blessing of giving as opposed to receiving. Now, I've been told I'm only going to get one present this year, but I'm, I've been told it's a stem winder. I, and I have, listen, I don't have any idea what it is. All I know is that, that, that Rhonda and both of my kids all contributed to one gift. And so, you know, normally we get together and we just, everybody's got several gifts and we just go around. Everybody opens one at a time, one at a time. And so I said, well, do I get to go first or am I going last? Because I've only got one. I can't wait to see what it is. Apparently, it was Shelby's idea. She's pretty smart about these things, so this could be a really good one. This could be a really good one. But I, I, I never think about Christmas in view of Acts 20, 35, but what I don't remember, when Jeffrey and Shelby were about, well, I don't think either one of them was even 10 years old, and my mom and Freeman got them a Nintendo 64 for Christmas. And we were still having Christmas in Missouri at that time at my grandma and grandpa's house there on Breezeway Drive. And we were in the den. And I remember when they opened that thing up, Jeffrey lost his ever-loving mind. He ran around the house hollering at the... And y'all remember what he looked like, right? I mean, you know, about four foot tall, weighed about 13 pounds. You know, and, and he run all over that house screaming, I got a Nintendo 64, I got a Nintendo 64. And I just remember how happy Mom and Freeman were when they, when they saw the response, when they saw the response to that gift. And that's really the epitome of what it means to, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we need to carry that attitude and that, that mindset into our giving with regard to our responsibility uh, to the Lord. Because unlike 
unlike the gift that my folks gave Jeffrey. You know, Jeffrey had provided nothing to them ahead of time, at least of a, a financial value, you know, of no real value, in, that they repaid him. Whereas all of us have received so much from the Lord. I mean, who among us, and even who in the within the sound of my voice, now or hearing this later on Facebook or YouTube, who among us can say, I've really not been that blessed by the Lord? I dare say not a single one of us. And I believe if anybody would dare say it, I believe we could probably sit down and correct and correct that problem in short order. And so with that in mind, I want us to think about a few things this week. And again, I, I knew once I had prepared the, the first message over the Lord's Supper that I was not going to get through this outline this week. So, and so we'll just we'll just go we'll just go a little while and we'll find us a good jumping off point and then we'll jump back in, Lord willing, uh, next Sunday morning. But the blessings of generous giving. Number one, generous giving reminds me that everything belongs to God. Generous giving reminds me that everything belongs to God. In Psalm 24, and in the first verse, the Bible says, The earth is the Lord and all of its fullness. In Psalm 50, and beginning in verse number 10, the psalmist says, Every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and all the wild beasts of the field are mine. And if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all of its fullness. There's a prayer that David made in, in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 29 that I think is also indicative of this. Where David was preparing mightily before his death to provide the materials for his son Solomon to build the temple. You know, David didn't get to build it, but the Bible says David prepared abundantly before his death. In other words, he wanted Solomon to get off to a good start in building the house of the Lord. And David says this in 1 Chronicles 29 and in verse 13, he says, Now therefore our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you. And of what belongs to you, we have given to you. David recognized as the king of Israel and the, the, the incredible prosperity of his people that all of it ultimately belonged to the Lord and that they were simply giving back to the Lord as sometimes we pray what is rightfully His. Generous giving reminds me that everything belongs to the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Moreover, it is demanded of stewards that a man be found faithful. The word steward, if I remember correctly, comes from, the, now the, I mean the English word, okay? The English word steward. If I remember correctly, comes from an old English word, which means to be the, the ward of a sty. In other words, sty ward. In other words, a sty is where we think of hogs are kept. And the ward is the one who is in charge of making sure everything is in order. So a sty ward, steward, means that here's someone who has been entrusted with the possessions of another. And thus that, that idea carries over for us in all of our financial dealings and our financial blessings, our prosperity, in that we have simply been given temporary overseership of the blessings of God. And I say temporary because Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 18 
Now think about this. Solomon was the wealthiest man who ever lived. The wealthiest man who ever lived. And after chapter 1 and chapter 2, where he talked about all the things that he had provided, all of the buildings, all of the gardens, all of the farming, all of the servants, all of the entertainment, all of that, he said, it's all vanity. Why? He says, because I must leave it to another. I must leave it to another. And so it is with all of the blessings that have been entrusted with us. We must be good stewards with the view that we will not take it with us into eternity, but must leave it to another. In Luke chapter 12, in the account of the rich but foolish farmer, if you recall this, he said, I'm going to take my knees. I'm going to eat and drink and be merry. I've had, I have much goods laid up for many years. And what did the Lord say? Thou fool, tonight your soul is required of thee. Then whose will these things be which you have provided? In other words, you're going to lose everything. His case, he was going to lose everything. Why? Because he was not rich toward God. All he was concerned about was his earthly treasures, and he had taken no thought, nor time, nor effort to lay up treasures in heaven. And so generous giving reminds me that everything that I have belongs to the Lord. Number two, generous giving honors the Lord. It honors the Lord. In Proverbs 3 and verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with all of thy substance and with the first fruit of all of your increase. What do we learn here? God comes first. God comes first. If we were going to talk about this, if we were going to talk about this in uh, financial terms, we would say this. We give to God off of the top. We give to God off of the top. In other words, we don't buy our house and get caught up in a house payment and buy a car and get caught up in a car payment or buy a boat or, or, or whatever it is that we might buy and get all caught up in that. And then once we've made all of our monthly payments, whatever we have left, we're going to give to the Lord out of that. By the way, I have talked to Christians who think that way. They think that, that their obligation to the Lord is what they have left over after they pay all their bills. I, had, I was just astonished. I mean, I was dumbfounded. That, that's, so I said, so what you're telling me is that if you can get your house payment, your car payment, and your boat payment, and your credit card payments high enough that they eat up all of your income, you don't owe the Lord anything. That's a, because that's exactly what you're saying. Well, no, I didn't mean it that way. Well, sure you did. Sure you did. If you're going to give the, if you're going to give the Lord leftovers after you've bought all the stuff that you want, if you ain't got nothing left over, then you don't think you, you, don't think you have an obligation to the Lord. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and beginning in verse 6, you know, a very well-known giving passage that he who sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. He who sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. You know, the word, I love the word bountifully there because it comes from the Greek word eulogos or eulogos, eulogy, meaning good word. In other words, our giving is a good word toward our attitude toward God and his blessing. It's a, you know, in other words, he who sows with a good word reaps with a good word, bountifully. In other words, what I give says a lot about my attitude, again, toward the Lord and his blessings. So generous giving honors the Lord. Think about this. It's not on your hand up. 
But when the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon, he was already the wealthiest man in the world. He was taking in 666 talents of gold every year. I mean, you start figuring that, you start figuring that in today's dollars, you know, how, how large a talent was and how many pounds were in a talent and then how many ounces are in those pounds, in those talents, times 666. It was an unbelievable amount of money that Solomon brought in just in gold every year. Now, but what could she do to add? What could she do to add to that? And yet the Bible says when she came to visit, she brought a wealth of gifts. Why? Because she had heard that Solomon had wisdom unlike any other man that ever lived, and she wanted to honor him when she came to speak with him. And hear his wisdom. And so it is with us that when we enter into the house of God and we enter into the worship of God, let us come bringing like gifts. By the way, there were three free will offerings for the Jews every year. You know, we, we tend to think of the Jews as simply being tithers, right? That, that you don't cut the corners. And if you drop something in the field, you got to leave it laying. And, and, you know, and you count through the herd, and every tenth one, you know, whatever it is, belongs to the Lord. And if you look at it, and it's, and it's not a, a good one, it still belongs to the Lord. And if you want to add another to it, that's fine. But the tenth one still belongs to the Lord. In other words, it, take, it takes, your, it takes your, your balancing out of it. The tenth one belongs to the Lord. And if you determine that's not a good one, I'm going to give that one to the Lord, and we'll give one more. So we think about the Jews in those, in those terms. But there were three times every year where the Jewish men, age 20 and up, were to appear before the Lord. And it says, And none of him shall appear before me empty-handed. In other words, in addition to all of the other giving that was required by the law of Moses, three times a year, every Jewish male appeared before the Lord with a gift in his hand, and no man dare show up in the presence of the Lord empty-handed. By the way, were there poor people in, in Israel in that time? Yes, there were. Was poverty, was poverty the exception to the empty-handed rule? No, it was not. Everyone brought something three times a year. Why? Because it honors the Lord. Generous giving honors the Lord. Number three, generous giving breaks the stranglehold of greed and materialism. Breaks the stranglehold of greed and materialism. Now, some of you, some of you draw basically the same paycheck, essentially week after week, or whatever it is that, that you draw, maybe out of your retirement or or whatever. Yep. But some of us, some of us, have other forms of income in addition to that. Yep. And I'm one of those people. You know, for example, if I go and I preach in a gospel meeting somewhere, you know, I'm, they're going to give me something. They're going to give me something. And so, in my mind, before I, before, I ever, before I ever hold a meeting, my intention is always to give a, a percentage of whatever it is that I receive, regardless of, what it, regardless of what it costs me, to go. In other words, I've got it set in my mind. If, 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 if my remuneration is this much, then there's a, that percentage... That percentage is what's going to be given. In other words, it helps, it helps me when I make, that, make my mind up ahead of time that I don't have to sit and think about it or ponder, ponder over it or, or start, start, weighing, you know, start weighing things out. And so as we think about, as we think about our giving, you know, if we will, for example, look, I think it's perfectly acceptable for Christians to, to determine ahead of time exactly at, at least you know, a percentage of what they're what they're going to give. Provide, you know, provided, it, you know, provided it is a, a reasonable, a reasonable and, and generous amount. And because it helps helps guard us against 
taking that, for example, taking that extra money and doing something with it that we want to do and not letting, giving the Lord his part. I want to give you a passage here. And, and by the way, I only discovered this recently. When I say recently, I mean in the last few years. Yep. How many of you have heard the phrase, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he? We've all heard that passage, right? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Right? I have never, ever heard that passage used or preached in its context. Now, it is a truism, okay? It is a truism that as a man thinks in his heart, that's what he is. Just by way of example, you know, Jesus taught us that in Matthew 15. You know, that, all, that what goes into a man's mouth does not defile him, but what comes out of his mouth defiles him because whatever comes out of his mouth or his actions originates in his heart. So it is a truism that whatever a man has in his heart is what he is. But in Proverbs 23, in Proverbs 23, the context in verses 4 through 8 is this. Don't eat the bread of a miser. Don't eat the bread of a greedy man because the whole time you are eating, he's taking it into account. And then the phrase comes, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now I think the overall meaning there is this, that we have to be careful when we're dealing with people that are greedy because they're always, they're counting, for example, they're counting every sin. You know, it's like, uh, it's kind of like the guy that takes a girl out on a date and tells her she can have anything on the menu when he ain't prepared for her to order the most expensive thing on the menu. All right, when, you know, in other words, you know, he's only got so much money in his pocket and he, and he probably, you know, he probably shouldn't have said order anything that you want on the menu. Because now he's got to start calculating if he's going to get anything that he wants or if he's just going to have a, you know, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich when he gets home. That's the context there. In other words, those that are greedy are counting out every penny. And, it, it, and I don't know any individual that, that this would apply to, but I'm sure, I'm sure that this would be a mindset, of at least somebody, because it's in the Bible, is that is that some people count their contribution as costing them something. In other words, they're looking at, they're looking at their weekly contribution and they're counting every penny and, and they're giving it, but while they're giving it, all they can think about is what they could have done with that money. You know, yeah, I, I could, if I, give, if I give a little more next week, I would do that. But there's some things I, I'd like to have. There's some things I'd like to do. There's, you know, there's Christmas gifts to buy or, or, or whatever. And so, as a man thinks in his heart, is in the context of greed. It's in the context of greed. And so the wise man says, be careful when you deal with people that are greedy because they are counting every morsel. Every bite you take, they're taking it into consideration. By the way, in the parable of the rich farmer that I mentioned earlier in Luke 12, the precursor to that and the impetus behind it was a statement that was made to Jesus by a man who said, Lord, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, as I understand Jewish culture, that when a man died, the oldest in other words, let's just say, if, a, if I understand it correctly, if a man died and he had three sons, his, his, his wealth or whatever it is he inherited would be divided four ways. But the oldest son would get two, and then each one would get a part. In other words, the oldest son got twice as much as all the other heirs. That's my understanding. So what you have here is not a situation where the father left everything to one son and nothing to the other son. The problem was the other son wasn't content with what he had been given by his father. 
And he saw the Lord as an authority figure, and he wanted the Lord to intervene in this, in this physical problem. And he wanted the Lord to tell his brother to share more. And that's when Jesus said the parable of the rich but foolish farmer. And the opening line is this. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So we got to remember, what was the reason? What was the reason for that statement and the parable that followed? The reason was one brother was not satisfied with what his father had given him. That's what it boils down to. In other words, Jesus didn't interfere in that man's affairs, but he did cut right to the heart of the matter, didn't he? He said, who made me a ruler and a judge over you? And then he gives the, the statement and the parable. Think about this. In John chapter 12 and verse number 6, as the, as the, the, the precious ointment, the, the alabaster box was broken and the ointment was anointed on Jesus, Judas said, why was this not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And the Bible of John answers this. He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the bag, and he bare for himself what was therein. Judas had a materialism problem. Judas had a greed problem. Judas had a covetousness problem. And he was willing to sell out the Lord to satisfy his love of money. But generous giving breaks the stranglehold of greed and materialism. All right, last one for this morning, number four. Number four. Generous giving lays up treasures in heaven. Generous giving lays up treasures in in heaven. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 1 and in verse number 12 he says, For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. In other words, Paul said, by the way, this was the last letter Paul ever wrote. He said, everything, everything that I've ever laid up in heaven, everything I've ever sacrificed, everything I've ever given, every harm I've ever suffered, every stripe I've received is all laid up at the master's feet and in his care. And I have not one shred of doubt that that treasure will be waiting for me when I'm gone shortly from the walks of this life. Which is why Paul closed with that exact same epistle when he said, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day, and not to me only, but to also all those who love his appearing. Didn't get very far in our list this morning. So many marvelous blessings that come our way. We have a proper attitude toward our possessions and are willing to give as the Lord would have us give. When we think about the invitation each and every Lord's Day or every time it's extended, we need to remember the invitation is extended because a great gift was given to us. A gift that we could never secure for ourselves, we could never buy it, we could never earn it. Collectively, we could never begin to make the first payment on it. And that is the gift of Jesus on the cross. And when we obey the gospel, we accept that gift that has been offered to us in Christ. And we follow Christ into death and burial and resurrection through the watery grave of baptism, Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. And become a partaker of that gift 
And that as Christ was raised from the dead to die no more, even so we also raised in newness of life, prepared to die no more. If you're here this morning and you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, or if you're here as a child of God and you have not been a good steward, or there's some other thing that has crept into your life that stands between you and a proper relationship with the Lord, if we can assist you in any way in your to begin your walk or to get you back on a faithful walk with God, then we want you to come right now together. We stand and sing this song.